Amen. If you have your Bibles, open them to uh, Ezekiel chapter number 37. Ezekiel chapter number 37. I read the book of Ezekiel a couple weeks ago. Kind of an unusual book to read before Christmas, but uh, the Lord put it before me. Normally my tradition is the first Sunday of the year to give you kind of a, you've heard of the country, we have a state of the union, the president will come in January and he'll give you the state of the union of our country. Usually the first Sunday of the year I give you the state of the church, but I'm not going to do that today. Um, I'm going to probably try to do a little bit of that, tone down, because we're going to be introducing what we're going to be talking about for the next couple of months, our core values here at New Holland. We're going to talk about that next Sunday. But uh, today, I, I really felt led to uh, talk not about our nation or really about our church, but what I would call the need of the Christians in our nation today. Ezekiel, there is one phrase in the book of Ezekiel that is in there 40 times. You think God was trying to get a point across? He said it over and over and over again. It's not in every chapter, but in some chapters it's four times. And it seems to be the theme of the entire book. And it's this one phrase, then they shall know that I am the Lord, their God. Then they shall know that I am the Lord, their God. You see, Ezekiel was writing to Israel, to the Jews. And obviously you remember before that, they were one nation with King David and King Solomon. And, but after Solomon died and his son Rehoboam was king, there was a split in the kingdom. Two kingdoms, the southern kingdom and the northern kingdom. And the northern kingdom of ten tribes, they quickly ran to, I just want to be quick and to the point, idolatry. And you can define that in a hundred different ways, but it was basically living their life away from God, living their life ignoring God, saying that yes, there is a God, but he was no longer the personal God of Israel. And they got all of these other things blended and mixed together, and it left them confused. And God was a jealous God. God would not bless them. And they were taken into captivity by the Assyrians. But the southern country, the tribe of Judah, the tribe of Benjamin, we call them Judah, they had one foot with God and one foot in the world. And how many of you know that doesn't work? Because if you put one foot in belief and one foot in unbelief, unbelief will win every time. Now that's a fact. That's not an opinion. And it bothers me because the same thing that came with Israel and then to Judah I believe is happening to the church of God in our world today. One foot with God, one foot in the world, and the world seems to be winning. We could talk about how bleak it was, but I, I just want you to know that I believe God is at work. I believe that God is going to do in 2020 an absolutely wonderful outstanding and amazing work for all who want to be a part of it. I don't believe God's into the twisting arms business. I, I don't believe that he's going to force somebody to do something that they don't want to do. But God is always there calling people with <clears throat> his love and his light to himself to better them, to bless them. He, he so wants to do an amazing God work in the lives of his people. So, if you have your Bible, open them to uh, Ezekiel 37 and stand with me. And we're going to begin at the end. We're going to begin in verse number 11. Then he said to me, Son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. They indeed say, Our bones are dry. Our hope is lost, and we ourselves are cut off. Therefore prophesy and say to them, Thus says the Lord God, 
Behold, O my people, I will open your graves and cause you to come up from the graves and bring you into the land of Israel. Listen to verse 13. Then you shall know that I am the Lord. That's one of the 40 phrases. 40 times this, this is repeated. Then you shall know that I am the Lord when I have opened your graves, O my people, and brought you up from the, your graves. This is my prayer. I will put my spirit in you, and you shall live. And I will place you in your own land. Then you shall know that I, the Lord, have spoken it and performed it, says the Lord. Let's pray together. Father, this is your word. I pray that as Ezekiel saw it and understood it, and, O oh God, as you promised it and performed it there, that the Spirit of God would speak. And Lord, it would speak life, breath, spirit. Speak directly your will to our minds and our thoughts. Father, all is vain if you don't speak. So Lord, look at your people that you love so very much. And Father, we stand once again every day, which includes this day, Asking, O oh Lord, that you draw us close. Asking, O oh Lord, that you would look beyond our faults and see our need. And Lord, that you would speak your spirit upon us once again. Father, I don't know what you have planned for us in 2020, but I do pray for a 2020 vision. I do pray that we would have eyes to see your hand at work in our midst. And Father, a heart, a heart willing to join you and Father, a passion, a passion for you and for you alone. Lord, I do pray once again, change our heart, O oh God. May it be fully pleasing unto you. I pray that in this year, we will shake off the dust of this world and walk with you. For your will, by your strength, and in your name, for your glory we pray. Amen. You may be seated. As a Christian, we must know and understand and believe and live that we are victorious. That God has called us to victory. And as Christians, we're not hunting victory. We live in victory. As a matter of fact, our goal in life is to wake up every day and walk from victory to victory. That may be a mindset that's different. That may be a mindset that's changed. It may be that, that all we can see is the, the drudgery and the difficulties and, and the striving and the circumstances of this world. But our God in heaven has such a greater view, and he looks at it, and he sees the possibilities. And he is looking for someone that he can bless and pour out on. And church, may that be us. May we be the ones that are so tuned into him, so praying to him, so seeking him, with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. That's what it says, Jeremiah 29, 12, and 13. When we seek him and we pray to him, we will find him, and he will hear us, and he will answer. That's the need of New Holland. That's the need of the believers today. We don't need a different God. We've got the best. We just need to put our heart and our trust into the God that we have. But something has happened to us. It's talked all the way through the New Testament. We are reminded of God's people in the Old Testament, how they walked away from God, and we are all prone to wander. In the New Testament, it's called being carnal, walking after what we would call the flesh, the ways of the world, the desires of man. Well, in Ezekiel 37, it talks about a different kind of flesh. Listen to what he says there in verse number 1. The hand of the Lord, the hand of the Lord came upon me and brought me up in the spirit of the Lord. This literally says the anointing of God came upon Ezekiel and took him to the place where he could see the spirit of God was there to bring him from the place that he was to give him the anointing to be able to see. And I pray that he does that for us today. And it says in verse 1, it set me in the midst of the valley. 
and it was full of bones. Ezekiel didn't choose this place. God chose it. And he took him there so that they could have a, a walk together. He took him to an old battlefield where the sun had scorched the bodies of those that had been slain in battle. Now to the Jew, the body of someone who has passed is a very precious thing. They would take the body, and they would wash the body, and they would anoint the body, and they would wrap it in cloth, and then they would take it, if they could not dig a grave, uh, very, um, very rocky soil, and if they did not, could not dig the grave, they would try to find a place to keep it. Oftentimes in that hilly country, they would find a cave there, and they would lay the body in a cave. They had a certain amount of time in which to do it. But even though they were in battles, it was the normal procedure to go and find those who were slain in battle and do for them what you would do for any good Jew in that day. But here, he took him to a battlefield, and all around him were the remnants of the slain that were there. And the sun had come upon them. Most likely, listen, this is graphic, but most likely the birds, the buzzards, the others had come and eat the flesh off the bone. And there they just laid, and the sun dried them out. And with the anointing of God upon the prophet of God, they walked together because God wanted them to see the valley filled with bones. Verse 2, then he caused me to pass by them all around. Behold, they were very many in the open valley, and indeed, they were very dry. Here in verse 3, here he comes to the purpose of it. He said to me, son of man, can these bones live? Now, if it was Brian, and God took me, and I'm out there, and I'm on the, the remnants of this battlefield, and all around you, all you see is dead, dry bones. My answer would be, absolutely not. Now, you can judge me by my poor spirit and lack of faith if you want to, but that would be the vision of Brian. I would look at it and I would say, there is nothing in me that says that life can come to this place. And if we're very honest, when we look at the circumstances and the situation and the place that God has placed us, like we said earlier, children aborted at record numbers more than everything else in our country. And we're living with crime, depravity, drugs, alcohol, Racism, murder, violence, family against family, no morality, no vision of life. And sometimes we even look at America today and we say, where's our hope? Sometimes when I hear things quoted like Sheila quoted, 70, did you say 70% of those that admit they had abortion were from the church? The lines seem to be getting blurred today. We're not sanctified. We're not separated from the world. We look just like the world. We act just like the world. And the power of God has left us. And, and sometimes we look at it and we, we hear the commandments of God and we say, no, I don't really believe that God can bring life. But the answer Ezekiel said very well. He said, Can these bones live? He said, oh, Lord God, you know. You know what he's saying? It's up to you. It's up to you. Does God want to bless? Can we just talk for just a moment? Does God want good for you? Does God want to bless you? 
I'm not talking about with bigger and better. But you, the real you. The real you. I'm not defined by this frame that you see up here. I don't want to be defined by what this frame represents. The real me, you just don't see. You have to get to know me. So, it's up to God. He said in verse 4, prophesy to these bones. I know they're just bones, but the word prophesy means speak unto them. Speak life unto them. Speak truth unto them. Church, we're called to speak life. We're called to speak truth because we can't bring life to dry bones, but, but, but the prophecy of God can. He said, say to them, O dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. There's only one thing that's going to help. It's been working for a long time. I don't think it's lost its power. It found me where I was and changed me. It made me alive. Ephesians 2. And you he quickened, he made alive, who were dead and your trespasses and sin. And that's where I was, dead with no hope, with no life, when God found me. And the same way that he found me, he found you. Amen? And the same way, the same salvation that brings life is the hope of the world. It is the Christmas story. It is the hope for America. It is the hope for his church. In Sunday school, we were studying this morning and we were speak, there was a, a story of a man with stage four cancer who was living life in his days. And here is the phrase that it said, dancing at the edge of heaven before he stepped into heaven. And I thought, amen, that's a good phrase, right? There. That's a bumper sticker right there, isn't it? Lance said, that's a t-shirt. Dancing on the edge of heaven before we get to heaven. Wouldn't that be wonderful, Brother Bradley, if the people of God could say, that's where I want to live my life? I want to be so close to heaven. I want to be so close to the breath of God, so, so close to the breath of life everywhere that I go. Can God make a difference? Lord, you know. Speak life. Speak life's what he says. Let them hear the word of the Lord. My prayer is in that in 2020, we will speak forth the word of God. Verse 5, thus says the Lord God to these bones, Surely I will cause breath to enter into you, and you shall live. Ruach. Ruach, really. There's a K on the end of it. It means breath. It means wind. It means life. It also can be defined as our mind, our spirit, our being. To speak life. A little child is born. They get a good, big breath of life. A person passes, and we say they take their last breath. But you know, you really can't ever live until you take your last breath here and you take your first breath there. And for the Christian, we get born again. We take our last breath of the sinful life and we take our first breath of the saved life. And our life from that point forward is not to be lived for us, it's to be lived for Him. In the New Testament, it talks about walking according to the flesh. That's the ways of this world. That's the desires that we have. 
But as a Christian, we're not supposed to follow the flesh. We're supposed to follow the breath of life. He says, speak to them. Surely, the God in heaven says, I will cause it. I will make it happen. I will cause breath to enter you, and you shall live. This is my prayer for the Christian church. This is my prayer for your, you as individuals, that God would speak his life into you. And that we'll live like we've never lived before. That we'll live a heaven life now. That we'll dance on the, the edge of glory now. He says in verse 6, I'll put sinew on you and bring flesh upon you, cover you with skin and breath in you, and you shall live. Then you shall know that I am the Lord. I looked this up. That word sinew means, really, it can be translated tendons. But he's speaking of all those things coming back upon the, the bones and then the flesh covering it. But listen, they were laying there, but it still looked like a corpse. The dry bones now had the, all the living parts back to them and the skin covering them. But hear this, they're still dead. They looked like the old life, but they're still dead. That meant they had muscle back. They had beauty back. But they were still dead. So he says, so I prophesied as I was commanded. And as I prophesied, there was a noise. There was a rattling. And the bones came together, bone to bone. Indeed, as I looked, the sinew in the flesh came upon them, and the skin covered them, but there was no breath in them. And he said to me, prophesy to the breath. Speak truth unto the breath of God. Prophesy, son of man, and say to the breath, thus says the Lord God, come from the four winds. That is the same word, ruach. O breath, O ruach. And breathe on these slains that they may live. So I prophesied as he commanded me. And breath came into them. And they lived and stood on their feet. Listen to me now. An exceedingly great army. Church, that is the battle cry for the coming year. That is the battle cry for the Christian church. We are to come and we're to speak forth life. Speak forth the breath of God, the truth of God. We can't cause it to happen, but we can release the word of God through us. God is God. He can do anything that he wanted to. He's God. He could have sent an angel to speak to them. He could have just let the breath of go around. But he said, prophesy. And as you, as you speak, the words will find their place, and the breath of life can come in them. Now, can you see the valley? And can you see all the dry bones? But then you see all the muscles come back. And, and right in front of his eyes, the skin is there. But it still looks bleak. It still looks like there's no hope. But as he, as he spoke life into them, something happened. They became alive. That's the mission of the church. Listen to me now. One soul at a time. One heart at a time. One child at a time. One adult at a time. One young married couple at a time. One senior adult in the hospital at a time. They need life. Jesus said, I have come that you might have what? And that you may have it how? You think God's up for that? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting what? Does God want life? What are we here for? What is the purpose of the church? You see, there was a great nation that walked away from God, dead in their trespasses and sin. Does that not sound like us? But yet God called us back to life. Nicodemus had our issue with that. How can a man who is old be born again? I can testify to that. Can you testify to that? Come on, can you testify to that? Then you have a word to tell. You have truth to proclaim. 
And it is your privilege. It is your privilege to speak life. I can't do it, but God can. There is something in the medical world when someone who is, has a disease or has something that will cause death, and then amazingly, they are healed. By the way, I've seen this. I've seen this. I, I had a church member who went to the Mayo Clinic in Jacksonville, Florida, and they were doing a procedure on him, and the doctor found cancer all in him and just basically just sewed him up and, and, and set an appointment with an oncologist. That night he came from the hospital on a Wednesday night. We called it prayer meeting, though we did more Bible study than prayer. And when he told his story, I put a chair right here, and I said, Church, it's time for us to pray. And the whole church gathered around that. And, and folks, we've prayed before, but there are times that you pray that the Spirit of God, the anointing of God is there in abundance. And it was nothing that we did out of our words, but God met us there. And we prayed for God to use that as a miracle uh, of healing in his life for the glory of God for all others to, sow, to see. Well, he did what he was told to do. He went to the oncologist, and the oncologist did MRIs and all the other stuff so they would know exactly what they were up against. And then they, they, the doctor said, we need to have a meeting. And they met with him, and, and, and the oncologist said, uh, I've done all the tests, and I'm just telling you, there's no cancer there. Listen, the other doctor was offended. He said, I've been a doctor so long. He said, I know cancer when I see it. I opened him up, and I saw that. He said, I know cancer. He was full of cancer. And he said, well, I'm not telling you that. I'm just telling you right now it's gone. In the medical field, they actually have a term for this. Spontaneous remission. <laughs> you know, when you don't have anything else to say, you just say the best you can. Amen? You know what I want to see in the coming year? I want to see spontaneous <laughs> remission. Amen? Amen? I want to see people that are dead and their trespasses and sins and somebody who loves, who has the love of God in them, who is just grateful that they were saved, that they were born again, to come and just simply let the Word of God do the work of God, prophesy, thus says the Word of the Lord, speak life into them, and let God do some spontaneous remission. Well, I don't understand it. Well, I don't understand it, but I'm gloriously saved by it. Can you tell me, is there anything else that we as a church are supposed to be doing? I, I, I'll leave you with this. If we don't, what's going to happen? dry bones. The last phrase there was he raised up an exceedingly great army. Y'all like that? That's not one. That's all of us. Oh, what God could do. Oh, what God could do. Lord, give us 2020 vision. Let's pray. Father, you are a great God. I thank you that you are the author of life and you have given life. You've given us an opportunity. And Lord, there is a need in our world today, a need that only you can meet. Father, we can't do it. Only you can. But Lord, thank you for letting us be a part of it. And Father, if there's anyone in this building today that does not know you and your joy and your peace and your cleansing and forgiveness, if they haven't come to you with belief and repentance, Lord, I pray that they will today. They would trust you and confess you as Savior and Lord. Ask you to do for them what only you could do to save them, 
Lord, to breathe life into them. Father, I know you want this more than anything else. Lord, if there's anyone in this building, may they receive it today. May they know right now in their spirit that it's you that's speaking and calling them. Make they turn from their sins, never to seek to, to live that way again. And Lord, to believe and trust and ask you to save them. Cry out to you, O oh God. And Lord, for those that are in this building today that have already trusted you as Savior, Lord, would you give them a vision in this community, in their maybe in their own families, where they work, where they go to school, where they play, their friends. May they see all the dry bones in those places where somebody needs to prophesy and speak, thus saith the Lord, speak life. Then Lord, you and you alone can cause new life to happen. But Lord, we know that you want to do that so very much. Father, begin that work even today. Father, this invitation is yours. You extend the Holy Spirit one heart at a time. Lord, may it be met with belief and may it be met with repentance and may, we, Lord, we join you in your work. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.